Before the Cuban Revolution 60 years ago and after it, Canada maintained solid cultural, academic, and economic exchanges with that country. And while Canadian tourists may still be heading south to Cuban shores without difficulty, doing much beyond that has become challenging for citizens of both countries. Here for more, Karen Dubinsky. She's a professor of history and global development studies at Queen's University. And Juno-nominated musician Elizabeth Rodriguez from the Afro-Cuban roots and jazz band Okan. And we are delighted to welcome both of you here to our studio tonight. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, Karen, I got to ask you, can I start with a bit of an odd question? Sure. I want to ask you something that you've got on your Twitter feed here. Your bio says you're a historian, teacher, writer, and a Cuban trapped in the body of a Canadian. What does yes. that mean exactly? Um, that means, I guess, because of the amount of time I've spent in that country, it's become like a second home. I bring a lot of students there. I have a lot of friends there and Cuban friends here in Canada. It's a little bit of an irony, and I always say it's only on the outside because I cannot dance. <laughs> How many times have you been? Oh, man, I've, since 1978. So 40 plus years. 40 plus years, 40 plus times. Oh, really? You probably, go pretty much yeah. every year. Now that I do, now that it's work, you know, now that I, hmm. I do research there and I bring students there, I go at least twice a year these days. What was the initial attraction? Oh, I was young and uh, naive and uh, a little bit naive and wanted to change the world. I went to a youth festival in 1978. Cuba seemed to be, for somebody, for a young North American who wanted to change the world, Cuba seemed like a good place to go, and it, you know, it still is. I'm not so naive about sh about Cuba's uh, relationship to changing the world, mm -hmm. or my own for that matter, but it was a really politically and culturally interesting place then, and it still is. Understood. Now you are a Cuban trapped in the body of a Cuban, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> but living in Canada. Living in Canada, on your way to achieving Canadian citizenship? Yes, I'm a Canadian resident, and now I will be a citizen soon. And tell us more about what you're doing in Canada now. So I'm a musician, a self-employed musician. I teach music as well. I teach violin and piano. Where do you do that? I do that at On the Offbeat Music School. I have private students, 12 private students of violin and piano. And we just recently actually had our uh, concert last Sunday. And uh, I have my own band that is called Okan. And what does that mean? Okan means heart in Afro-Cuban dialect. And me and my wife, we have this band together. And we do this with our hearts, and that's why we name our band Okan. What initially brought you from Cuba to Canada? Music. I was playing at the Broad Music Festival in 2013, and I was the first foreigner to be invited um, in 25 years what, to that festival. Which music festival? Broad Music Festival in Hamilton. Oh, like Boris Broad. Yeah, Boris Broad. Oh, okay. Exactly. Uh, so I'm, I'm here because of Boris Broad. I've only known Boris for about 55 years. Yeah. <laughs> He's amazing. No. He's yeah. an amazing human yeah. being. <laughs> he is. Oh, can we show a little of what you do? Of course. Okay, Sheldon, you got that clip standing by? Let's roll it. Ese amor que no se halla en cualquier sitio. All right. What was that song about? That was called Mil Palabras. It means a thousand words. And I wrote it um, for my wife, actually. And uh, it talks about beautiful things that I have to say about her. And the lyrics and translation to the lyrics are on our website. Which is what? Ocanmusica.com. Okanmusica.com. You had a concert this past spring, I think, right, in Ottawa at the National Arts Center? Yes. Okay. W were family members there? Nope. What happened? So what happened was that the embassy in Havana closed right before my grandma got her notification um, of her fingerprints, because now they're taking fingerprints as well. And... My plan was to bring my, can my grandma for the first time to Canada because it was National Arts Center with my own band. It was like a big deal for me, right? Um, and we were headlining the, the festival as well. And I was like, what, why not to bring my grandma? That would be a great present. She turned 72 and I've never bring her yet. I haven't 
bring anybody from my family yet to, to Canada. Canada. And I felt that this was the year. And she wanted I to do it? I could do it, of course. Of okay. course she and wanted to And what happened when she, when she went to the embassy to try to get whatever It was organ. closed. Okay, Completely the whole embassy closed. isn't closed, but the immigration part of the embassy was closed. Mm -hmm. It was closed, they, they couldn't talk to anyone. There, there was absolutely no information. I was having the information here. Uh, the only thing she knew there is that they closed. That hmm. was it, no one had an actual idea of what was happening. Karen, and what was happening? Well, ironically, I was there. I was in Havana in May with my students. I bring, uh, I'm part of a group that brings 20, 30 Queen students to Havana uh, for a course at the University of Havana every year. Uh, what was happening there was brutal. It was a really sudden decision. I knew, I know of people who were Kind of, you know, in the system, but basically trapped in the system mm -hmm. with no information about whether they had been approved or what the new procedure would be. Elizabeth is correct. They just shut the door of the immigration um, section of the of the embassy, and it was chaos for a long time. Um, it's still it's still chaos because what the the kind of advice that's being given to Cubans who want to visit is go to a third country, go to Mexico, which itself requires a visa for Cubans to get to, aside from the expense, which okay, is enormous. Cubans, to, to come to Canada, they would have to get a visa to go to Mexico, yeah. then mm -hmm. in Mexico, get a visa to come yeah. to Canada. And in Mexico, the process is 18 days. Yeah. So yeah. the Cuban families will have to pay for their families to be there 18 yeah. days in Mexico. And also, in my case, for example, I couldn't say my grandma, 72-year-old woman, to Mexico City for 18 days all by herself, and how much money that would that cost me? Yeah. Right. Do we have any understanding of why all of a sudden this would have happened? There are many theories, I suppose. I think the most, for me, the most plausible or the most likely is that it does have to do with the health concerns that the uh, embassy staff, not the health concerns, the health effects, the, the health problems that embassy staff have experienced as a result of these mysterious, I don't want to call them attacks, nobody knows what they are. This is our staff. Our staff, mm -hmm. our Canadian, Canadian staff. Canadian officials in Havana. That's mm -hmm. right. Um, and the Canadian officials, the Canadian staff in the embassy had to launch a lawsuit against the federal government to get them, my understanding is, to try to get them to take it more seriously. They were of the opinion that these, their health issues were being, you know, overlooked, um, hidden under the rug, not just not being dealt with adequately. Mm -hmm. So as a result, the federal government reduced the number of staff. They're operating at 50% capacity. Why did they choose to do this with the immigration branch and not with the other parts of the embassy? So much of what an immigrant or a visitor visa involves mm -hmm. is online now. Why can't the biometric testing be done at another embassy? Sometimes those can, kinds of things can be done at the mm -hmm. airport. We're basically telling people to go to wherever, Mexico or wherever, to have their fingerprints taken and a facial scan. And then maybe you will get a visa and or then not. Maybe, That's exactly. the other thing, that exactly. you don't but, know if you will get a visa because Cubans need, the, pay, the amount of paperwork that a Cuban needs in order to come to Canada is ridiculous. Hmm. You need to have money in your bank account, like $2,000 minimum. Everybody knows Well, because they're afraid you're gonna leave and not come back. So you gotta show that you're gonna come back. Yes, but it's really hard for any Cuban to have $2,000 in their bank account. Mm -hmm. But also, um, as, as a Cuban, I have to defend our people a little bit. Every Cuban that comes here and maybe stayed uh, at some point illegally, but it stayed, mm -hmm. they're here working. Mm -hmm. And affording a lot of things mm -hmm. to the community and to the country, and sending money back home, and sending and money right. back home. Very few, and not, yes. and not every, by no means, not everybody stays. We've no. worked. I've worked with professors, with musicians, with um, art people in the arts, people who come to Canada to, you know, to give a talk or to do a concert. They don't want to stay here in clear, mm -hmm. clean floors. Why would they want to do that if they okay. have? But Karen, uh, we got to we got to we haven't touched on this yet. So let's yeah. just put the put the uh, hammer to the nail's head here. There's a suspicion that someone somehow in Cuba is blasting sonic. I don't even know what the yeah, expression is. Sonic yeah. what? Yeah. Sonic. Um, yeah. They're calling it attack? Airwaves or yeah. whatever it is so at at the Canadian embassy, which is what's making everybody sick there. Does that, but well, then how come, for example, the Canadian government doesn't say to the tourists, to the Canadian people, don't go there. It's not safe for you. 
Yeah. For example. I mean, this sounds like something out of a spy novel. What do it you think is really going on like here? It you know, it, it does sound like something that, uh, you know, Tom Clancy might want to oh. write about, and maybe he has a better idea than anybody else. There's been a million theories. There's been lots of right coverage about it. Every major magazine in Canada and the U.S. has written about, um, has written speculative, in, in a very speculative way, because the fact is nobody knows. I'm not denying that people suffered health effects. I know people mm -hmm. that did. People, somebody I know who worked at the embassy. I'm not saying don't take it seriously. I'm not saying it's some kind of crazy mass hysteria. Not at all. But there's ways of dealing with it that don't affect the Elizabeth people. Rodriguez's grandmother, that right. who has nothing to do. What's your with theory this. as to what's actually going on here? You know what? I actually don't have one. <laughs> I don't. I don't think. Yeah, I think. You know, somebody's gone rogue from what government? I and mean, when we really could. Do go into, you know, spin into Tom Clancy territory here in terms of which government, who has an interest in this, who doesn't have an interest in, who doesn't have an interest in this is the Cuban government, right? Mm. So they make so much money from, from tourism that yeah. a million Canadians go to Cuba every year. Yeah. Mm. There is no point or reason for a Cuban government or whatever, which it's hard to believe, but. I don't think the Cuban government has a reason to attack Canadians. It would not be in their interest it, to do um, so. Absolutely, it, not. absolutely not. In whose interest would it be to disrupt this path? Hi, no one knows. No one knows. No one knows because Cuba is definitely a challenging country hmm. for for whoever lives there, for whoever wants to go there. Um, we have to also mention that this kind of uh, health issues started in the. American embassy, yeah. yes, also in 2017. In, yeah. in the Obama era, which is another important piece of this weird mm. puzzle, mm. is it a was... Trump conspiracy? Well, of course, mm. sounds like a Trump. Of course, who else but Trump would want to do something so diabolical, except it started pre-Trump, mm -hmm. the exactly. effects. But Trump right. made the decision of closing yes. the embassy yes. way before the Canadian embassy right. did. But given that, given that the Canadian embassy staff felt under attack in whichever way you want to interpret yeah. that. Do you think our people had any other alternative but to, uh, you know, send people home, protect their health, and shut down the services? No, that's totally fine. I understand protecting the people. What I don't understand is why you are affecting other people too. Like, like Karen said, you might be able to open the biometrics in another embassy, in mm. another office. Because you do have a staff there. They do have staff there still. Mm -hmm. But a solution for the Cubans in order to... It's not only my grandma. It's, there are people that married and they don't know their grandchild here in Canada. Mm. Yeah. Uh, people that don't know their kids in Canada. Hmm. You have told us that you've been taking for years and years trips of Canadian students down yeah. there. Yeah. Are those trips in jeopardy now? They're not in jeopardy, and that's the other, for me, well, probably one of the, the, you know, saddest things about this is that the lopsided relationship between Canada and Cuba is just going to get that much more lopsided on the, on the Canadian side. 1.5 million tourists go to visit every year. From Canada. From Canada to Havana, or to, to Cuba in general. Mm -hmm. um, we are able to invite one Cuban, usually, you know, academic or somebody from the arts or the music world to our university. We send 30 to 40, 20, yeah, between 20 and 40 students every year. Um, we receive one. That's a re reciprocal relationship. It's lopsided, mm -hmm. but it's it's reciprocal. We also receive student uh, Cuban students sometimes as well. We've had, I think, four Cuban graduate students over the recent past at Queen's. Um, now that's going to be zero. Zero S students and or staff Zero, yes. from Cuba Unless to Unless they Canada. happen to already have a multiple entry visa, unless we can figure out how to add to our budget to get them to, mm -hmm. to Mexico, to Trinidad, to Panama, to, you know, that, which is, given university budgets these days, pretty unlikely that we can do that. So it just means that we get all the benefits, Canada gets all the benefits of a nice beach or a nice holiday, uh, whenever, and Cubans are completely shut out of that relationship in terms of coming to Canada. Have you talked to anybody in the government of Canada about this? Um, I have. Well, to, in the government of Canada, I've written lots of letters and signed lots of petitions. Have you had letters I've, returned? I have not. I did speak with the Canadian amb ambassador in Havana when I was there in May. And? He had just arrived. He was a new ambassador. I could sort of tell that this, you know... 
this was a very undiplomatic situation that this mm -hmm. diplomat was was um, put into. Uh, we had a, you know, we had actually really honest conversations. I talked a lot about the way, uh, the kinds of things we've been talking about here. Uh, he definitely stressed the health issues. Hmm. You know, he definitely said we need to put in. There needs to be a, you know, uh, a, a period of time in which Canadian diplomats are not experiencing whatever it is, which is fine. But because of the mystery of whatever it is, it's really hard to see how this ends, right? Mm. How does this get resolved unless the larger issue of, the, of the, the health issues gets resolved? Okay, we understand now the impact on that side of the story. What about in Cuba? What do you think the impact on the Cuban population of all of this has been? Well, another issue is that because of the American embassy was closed, many Cubans, many artists mm. that I know mm -hmm. were coming from Cuba to Canada to apply for the visa to the U.S. Uh -huh. So now they're both doors So you can't shut. get into the U.S. either. You can't get to the U.S., you can't get to Canada. And there are so many artists that come here for jazz festivals, for concerts, so many things that happen and enrich the culture of Canada that now that won't happen. Yeah. Hmm. So it's a loss for everybody. Absolutely. Hmm. Huh. Karen, um, are you going to go back to Cuba at some point soon? Sure. I, uh, I'll definitely go next year in, uh, in May again with our students. Mm -hmm. We always go in May. I try to go in December for the, uh, for the film festival because our course focuses on Cuban culture. I mean, Which is cold here. Well, <laughs> yeah, because it's cold here. But yeah. the, uh, Which film festival is this? The Havana International Film Festival that takes place in December is a really great opportunity for people like me who teach about Cuban culture in Canada to get mm -hmm. a kind of a little, an update, an injection. Um, and then, you know, then our class starts in, in January. So yeah. yes, this is not, that's the, the, you know, this is not gonna harm a hair on my head as a Canadian with a passport and uh, mm -hmm. the visas that we get. It was a great oper learning opportunity for our students when we were there in May for us to be able to say, you know how we got a visa to come here, right? The flight attendant goes, walks down the plane and says, here's your visa, here's your visa. <laughs> Don't lose this piece of paper, it'll cost you $20. <laughs> um, that is so easy for Canadians to take that kind of mobility for granted. What about Elizabeth? Are you gonna go back to Cuba anytime soon? No. Um, I do have the possibility of coming back, no problem, because I'm a Canadian resident, mm -hmm. uh, so I have no problem leaving the country. But there are many things in Cuba happening right now in my personal uh, way too. Like, first of all, Cuba is getting so expensive. Mm -hmm. And as a Cuban, when you go to Cuba, you have to bring so much. What does that mean? Supplies. Supplies, uh, even toilet paper and uh, toothpaste and toothbrush and you mean for, soap. For the rest for of the family? For everybody. Oh, okay. For everybody because the shortage, shortage of um, food supplies and, and situation in Cuba, it's so hard. So it is very expensive for any Cuban to go to Cuba and visit their family. So that's why we usually do it once a year or every one and a half years. So I'm planning on going maybe in February because it's so cold here. <laughs> uh, but I'm not quite sure yet because um, my wife can't go to Cuba unless she's a Canadian citizen. She's from Cuba? Yes, okay. from Santiago de Cuba. So they're, they're, are you concerned that if you were to go down there, you or she would not be allowed out? She has a little bit more um, of an awkward situation because she came to Canada and uh, actually applied for refugee status and that's how she is a Canadian resident. And she already applied for her Canadian citizenship. Uh, so for her, going to Cuba is not as good or as safe. So that's why she hasn't been in Cuba. Got it. Uh, for six years. Six years? Yes. She's she hasn't seen her mother in six years. Hmm. So that's another issue. Our plan was to bring our families here for a visit. Her mother doesn't want to leave here. My mother does not want to live here. They want to come visit. If we are gonna have children eventually, it would be nice to have my mother here because we have absolutely no one else here in this country. Hmm. So it would be nice to have my mother to help us. Uh, my mother is a nurse, so it would be really, really good for me to have my mother here. Um, but that is, there's no way of that happening anytime soon, so I don't know. Sounds like a good class project for you, Karen. 
raising the future children of raising the Elizabeth and <laughs> her significant other. Um, Karen, let's finish up on this. You're, are you writing a book about Canadian-Cuban cultural relations? I am. You are. What's I the am. status of that book? Um, I'm, it's in process. I've just, I started researching it. I'm in, I guess I'm into year two of the research, but well, it's this... an academic project. It, I always thought it was a, I mean, I know it is a long-term project, as many academic projects are, but this has created a kind of immediacy to it that makes that is that is very motivating let's say well so, i was going to say the story is kind of different now isn't the it the story For it is so strange to start a project mm -hmm. that's on the you know on the history of and I, you know i'm not talking about the when pierre trudeau met fidel castro kinds of exchanges i'm more interested mm -hmm. in when elizabeth rodriguez met mm -hmm. boris brought you know those kinds of <laughs> those kinds of exchanges and there's a long history of those on both on both sides in the cultural realm education realm business ties um, so, so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm motivated to do more, but I'm also really committed to try to tell that story in, um, in its fullness, because there have been decades and decades and decades of friendships that are not the famous ones that involve the politicians, mm -hmm. right. um, but, but, you know, below the surface, really important ties. And those are the ties that are being potentially really harmed by this. Gotcha. But she already has books that are amazing. <laughs> There is one, that one I love, uh, Havana Beyond the Beach. Is I will recommend that book to every Canadian. Havana Beyond the Cuba, Beach? Cuba, Cuba Beyond the Beach. Cuba, Cuba Beyond, Beyond the Beach. Yeah, I took yes. it to, there we yes. go. Okay, we're plugging it already. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Karen Dubinsky, Elizabeth Rodriguez, we thank you both for coming into TVO tonight and sharing your views about this. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having us. Muchas gracias. <laughs> De nada. <laughs>